this is uh, an abbreviated version of a talk that I've given a couple of times um, just about the orchard. And it's really meant to just kind of very quickly run through uh, why we uh, made the decision to restore the orchard um, and then give you a quick update on where we are with that uh, restoration process. So you should be seeing uh, an image of the old orchard um, here from quite a few years ago. Um, you know, some, uh, some plants with some developing fruit on them. Um, these were all, all cut down just a couple of years ago, um, but before they were cut down, we harvested uh, cyan wood from them so that we could grow new trees. Um, and what I'd like to do is just give a uh, very short um, kind of uh, history of how we got to the point where we are today, um, and then talk about uh, what we've been doing for the last couple of weeks. Um, so uh, the, the orchard all really started with this gentleman, this is Stearns, Lothrop Davenport. Um, and he was an avid uh, orchardist. He had a, a personal orchard in uh, North Grafton, Massachusetts, uh, where he really was trying to collect uh, as many heirloom varieties of apples as he could. Um, and through a pretty long and drawn out uh, process, uh, the orchard eventually found its way here to Tower Hill. Um, and it was uh, really one of the very first projects that was undertaken as Tower Hill was, um, was being built into a botanic garden. Um, here you can see a really early shot of uh, Tower Hill. The lawn garden and secret garden are complete. Um, the first parking uh, areas are complete and the orchard is already planted. You can see it surrounding the, um, uh, surrounding the, the, the newly completed lawn garden here in this image. Um, so, you know, very early on, this is one of the very first projects that uh, the staff at the time at Tower Hill took on. Um, it was, uh, you know, it definitely had a very prominent location along the driveway as you uh, uh, head up the hill um, to the parking area um, and always was just a, uh, a, a big piece of the experience. Um, for many, many years, uh, we shared scion wood uh, that was collected from the, uh, from the orchard um, with folks that were interested. We had a very active program to distribute that scion wood um, through a small committee of volunteers, largely, uh, called the Orchard Preservation Committee. Um, and they would submit a report every year documenting their uh, activities to the Board of Trustees. Um, and so here's an example of a report from 2010. Um, it says that uh, the uh, Preservation Orchard Committee distributed almost 700 uh, pieces of scion wood from 111 different trees in the collection, um, and that those were uh, fulfilling 67 different orders mailed to 26 different states. It was not unusual um, for one of these reports to say uh, that they had shipped 800 or 1,000 pieces of scion wood um, and uh, we shipped to all 50 states um, and a handful of other countries as well, including as far away as Japan. Um, uh, definitely a lot in Canada, uh, all throughout Europe, um, uh, some in Central and South America. Um, so this was a, a really active um, program and a huge part of Tower Hill's effort to uh, continue the work of uh, Stern and Davenport um, through this preservation orchard. Unfortunately, just about now 11 years ago, um, the uh, orchard really suffered from a new, um, new ish uh, uh, bacterial disease called fire blight. Now, fire blight is uh, endemic to this area, so it's, it's always been here, um, but it was in the 2010 growing season um, that uh, the staff at Tower Hill at the time first saw fire blight really run rampant through the orchard. Um, Unfortunately, what that meant was we could no longer distribute cyan wood, um, and we had to go to pretty drastic measures to uh, protect and preserve the existing collection. Um, fire blight is, as I mentioned, a bacterial pathogen. Um, it's, uh, it, it can enter uh, a tree through uh, either uh, wound wood, you know, a fresh uh, pruning cut, um, through, uh, through leaf uh, tissue, um, but one of the primary vectors for, or one of the primary avenues for fire blight um, to enter uh, an apple is through, uh, through uh, flower buds or flowers, open flowers. Um, and what's really interesting about this story is that it's definitely a story about climate change. 
Um, so fire blight, as I mentioned before, is endemic to, uh, to the United States. It's, it, as far as we can tell, it's always been here in the Northeast, uh, but it was typically thought of as more of a summertime infliction of plants in the rose family. Um, it was something that would come in when we had uh, warmer temperatures and thunderstorms, uh, warmer temperatures and humid conditions. Um, so really needs to be about 75 degrees Fahrenheit and above for fire blight to be active. Um, and we never really saw those temperatures in the, in the early spring uh, or at the height of uh, bloom time um, in the apple orchard until about 10 years ago. That's when, when, uh, when we really started to see fire blight move in. Um, so I'm going to talk some about disease life cycles and some about how this pathogen works um, just to kind of summarize, you know, exactly what happened to, uh, to impact our orchard. Um, but very briefly, um, fire blight, again, is a bacterial pathogen. Um, every disease, plant disease, has ideal conditions uh, uh, for infection. So when that disease will become uh, its, its uh, most virulent. And for fire blight, it's rainy or humid weather with daytime temperatures above 75 degrees, especially when nighttime temperatures stay above 55. Um, and apples, fire blight typically enters through the flowers, like I mentioned before, um, or through wounded wood. It's very difficult to control because unlike a lot of um, uh, fungal or other bacterial um, pathogens, fire blight is uh, systemic, which means it gets into the vascular system of a, of a plant and, can, and it can move very rapidly through that vascular system to other parts of the plant. Um, uh, with diseases, it's really important that you have uh, three different factors in order to get uh, uh, disease symptoms. And so, in the, in, in, and this is true for all diseases, all plant diseases. First, you have to have a host plant that's susceptible. Fire blight doesn't impact uh, every plant that's out there. It really only impacts plants in the rose family. Um, you have to have the presence of the pathogen. As I mentioned before, fire blight's always been here, um, but the, conduct, uh, the conductive environment for fire blight is not something that typically showed up until later on in the summer. Um, and uh, what, what happened um, in this time period in 2010 is we had really early uh, daytime temperatures topping uh, 85 degrees at the time when the apples were really starting to come into bloom. Um, so here's uh, uh, weather data from Boylston uh, from 2010. And you can see from May 1st through uh, about May 5th, we had high temperatures uh, right at about 75 degrees or higher um, during a time period when it was pretty wet. We had some, uh, some rainfall at that time as well. And this was just the prime period when fire blight really moved through the orchard. Um, fire blight's interesting because it's a bacteria. Uh, a lot of times bacteria is just spread by kind of oozing, uh, 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 you know, mus uh, sort of mucilaginous goo. Um, but with fire blight, it's actually picked up by honeybees. Um, and the reason it can enter through a flower is because a honeybee will carry it from one flower to the next or from one tree to the next. Um, and so when you have temperatures of 75 degrees, when all those flowers are open and the uh, bees are doing their thing, um, they're moving that bacteria from one tree to the next and just running through an orchard like ours. Um, 1997 data here uh, showing that typical springtime temperatures in early May are really, you know, 50s down into the 40s in some cases. Um, we, the first time we hit 73 degrees was May 12th, uh, and then it dropped quickly down to 60s again. And these are, these are what we would have considered more typical or more seasonal temperatures. Um, but unfortunately, we, we're seeing a lot more um, springs like this than springs like this with much higher temperatures at the time when the apples are blooming. Um, again, this is what the life cycle of fire blight looks like. Um, so uh, infected blossoms will um, shrivel up, uh, fruit will be infective, uh, infected, uh, the bacteria will move into the woody tissue um, very rapidly. It, in fact, fire blight can, you know, kill uh, an entire tree in a single season um, if the conditions are right and the tree's weakened enough. Um, and, uh, and then typically it overwinters in, in, in wood, um, becomes active again in the spring when those temperatures uh, are, are reached and we get wet weather. 
So we went from an orchard that looked like this, that was quite beautiful and very productive, um, something that everyone, everyone who visited Tower Hill got to experience, um, to an orchard that more and more looked like this, uh, with lots of dead trees, uh, lots of trees that were, uh, you know, in varying stages of, 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 uh, of um, what's the word I'm looking for, decay, I guess, uh, and we really needed to do something about it. Um, my predecessor, Joanne, um, took a lot of really drastic steps to try to preserve the collection. Uh, our goal with this collection is not necessarily to be able to eat the fruit every year. Um, it's really to preserve these old varieties that exist in very few places other than Tower Hill. Um, and so she took some steps that, uh, you know, made the fruit unedible or inedible um, uh, in order to preserve the collection. But really what needed to happen was the, the orchard needed to be cut down and we needed to start from scratch. Uh, so in step John Bunker. Um, John uh, started Fedco Trees, runs an apple uh, CSA up in Maine, where he's from. Um, and John met with me just a couple of months after I started the job in 2018 to say, uh, your orchard needs to be cut down. Uh, the trees are too old, they're too uh, riddled with disease, and you need to start from scratch, and I'd like to help you do it. So um, John uh, came down in March of 2019 um, and took cyan wood off of every tree in the collection. So he took cuttings off of every single tree uh, that we had in the collection, brought those, brought those cuttings back up to, uh, to Maine uh, and worked with Fedco trees to uh, graft all that cyan wood onto um, really three different rootstocks. Um, so the rootstocks that were selected um, and I, I'm not going into a lot of detail on uh, what a rootstock is versus what a scion is. Um, very simply, the rootstock is the uh, is the the bottom half. The scion wood is spliced onto the rootstock. Uh, the rootstock imparts certain properties um, to the scion. The scion is the variety that you uh, that you're interested in growing. Apples don't come true from seeds, so they have to be asexually propagated. Uh, and the best way to do that is through is through grafting. Um, the rootstocks that we selected are fire blight resistant, also drought resistant, hardy um, to New England, this part of New England. Um, so we hope that the uh, the trees themselves will be better able to uh, uh, withstand um, fire blight, um, given that they're growing on different rootstocks now. Um, and so we chose M111, which is an older uh, uh, tried and true rootstock, and G890, uh, which is a fairly new rootstock that was developed through a uh, research station that Cornell runs in Geneva, New York, um, and also Antonovka. We, we grafted a handful of uh, trees onto Antonovka, which are standards, um, and those standards will get to be about 40 feet tall, and they'll live for a long time, uh, 100, 150 years. Uh, whereas the other two rootstocks that we're using uh, for the majority of the collection are semi-dwarf. So these are trees that will be about 15 feet tall, about 15 feet wide. Um, uh, perfect size for the orchard as we have it lined out. Um, the trees were ready for planting this spring. Uh, so the grafting was all done in 2019. Uh, the trees grew uh, for two seasons in a nursery um, and were, uh, we, I actually went and picked them up in Maine um, in, in late March. Um, and for the last couple of weeks, we've been planting them. Um, but before I get into planting, what I'd like to say is that we did um, cut every single tree down in November of 2019, uh, but we did some fun stuff with the wood. Um, so we, we, gave, uh, we gave quite a bit of the wood to a local uh, wood turner. Um, this is a guy named Reed Gilmore. Um, he and his wife um, uh, made a lot of really special uh, pieces out of, our, uh, out of our trees. Not every single variety, but a, a choice number of, uh, number of plants. Um, he made some uh, natural edge bowls. He made a lot of ice cream scoops and pepper mills, um, uh, some really fantastic bowls, um, some pens. Uh, we've been giving away some of this material, um, but we've also been selling it in the gift shop as well. So really, you know, one of a kind pieces. Every piece is a, is a little bit of Tower Hill history and is a, a, a you know, a piece of art in its own right. Um, and it was a nice way to actually do something with the wood. Um, he was excited to work with some of the apples because they had such great character. Um, because they were pruned so frequently uh, so that we could distribute cyan wood, um, there were a lot of uh, burls and, you know, really kind of interesting colors and, uh, and things like that. You can see in the natural edge bowl um, that's here in this image, uh, you can see some of that character really shine through. Um, 
but as I mentioned, we've been planting for the last couple of weeks. So this is April 7th, uh, and this is George Harrington in this photograph with me. Um, George um, is, uh, George also lives in Maine, and the, the orchard is the Frank L. Harrington Orchard. Um, you saw that name in my first slide. Um, uh, Davenport, uh, Lothrop Davenport was the gentleman who started the collection, um, but Frank Harrington uh, was the person who really was instrumental in bringing the collection here to Tower Hill. Um, John Trexler, our founding director, uh, worked very closely with Frank, um, who was an avid orchardist himself, um, to fund uh, the, uh, the move um, and br to bring all the trees uh, to Tower Hill. Um, so uh, George is very proud of the work that his father did. Um, he was very excited to be able to come uh, to Tower Hill on April 7th and help us plant the first ceremonial tree, which you see us doing here. Um, after April 7th, we worked with a lot of volunteers. There's a couple of you on the call I can see um, uh, to, to get these trees planted. Um, so far, we've planted um, almost all of them. We've got uh, the 238 uh, semi-dwarf trees in the ground. Uh, so we've, we're planted on both sides of the driveway. Uh, we worked with a lot of our existing garden volunteers to do the planting, uh, but we also brought in some groups like this one um, from local companies. So this is a group from Bay State Savings Bank. Um, we had them come in and help, uh, help with the tree planting for a day. Um, they were great. Well, not, the first group that came in, I asked if, the, if anyone had ever planted a tree. Um, no one raised a hand, so uh, they all got to plant their first trees here at Tower Hill, uh, helping us restore this, uh, this, this uh, very important collection um, in the heirloom orchard. Um, so that's where we are. We're finishing up planting next week. We have uh, about 30 trees left to plant, not quite 30 trees left to plant. Um, and those, uh, those are all grafted onto standard rootstocks and they will be lined along the driveway. So as you enter the garden, um, those trees will greet you um, for many, many years to come. They will outlive me, they'll outlive any of us. Um, and they'll definitely uh, make a big impact as you come up that driveway. Um, and they'll be there for, uh, you know, for future generations of uh, Tower Hill visitors to enjoy when we go through another one of these restorations, uh, hopefully about 30 years from now. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop think, sharing this. I think you could leave it up, Mark. I think it'll, okay. look, it'll look better on the recording side. Okay. All right. Um, sounds good. Yeah, the first question is when we think we'll start to see apples on the trees. Yeah, so we actually don't want to see apples right away. Uh, we really want these trees to spend the next couple of years um, developing a really strong root system um, and developing enough support uh, in terms of uh, uh, trunk diameter, uh, branching structure to support the weight. Uh, apples are really heavy. Um, so we want to make sure that our trees are, are heavy enough to support that added weight of apples. Um, in fact, we'll probably pick off uh, any developing fruit that we see this year, next year, the year after. I, I would expect it's, it's really four or five years before we'll start to see, um, you know, reliable fruit set and something that we can, we can actually start to enjoy. Great. Is there uh, a plan now or a future plan on what we think we might do with the apples? Um, so yeah, there's, we're, we're kind of limited in what we can do with the apples. Um, we have in the past definitely done a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, tastings, um, that kind of thing. Um, we, uh, we, um, we can't do cider, unfortunately, uh, because the Board of Health, re Health requires um, cider to be pasteurized, and that, that's not something that we have the uh, the, the facilities to do. Um, but I would hope that at some point we might be able to partner with like a local, uh, a local brewery. We might be able to sell uh, or, or pass along some of our apples. Maybe a, a brewery would be interested in doing some uh, heirloom apple cider, um, which could be really cool. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do that here. We'd have to, you know, partner with a local brewery and have them actually create the, uh, create the cider and then sell it. Um, uh, but we definitely always have uh, an apple festival um, in the fall where 
uh, we, we would, would encourage people to come out uh, and learn about these uh, unique and unusual um, apple varieties that exist here in the collection. Um, so even if we uh, can't enjoy cider directly off of the trees, um, we definitely try to get people to come out and, uh, and learn about all these apples. Um, and then we, for the last, uh, actually last year and this upcoming season, uh, we've been giving away produce to local um, uh, food pantries. We've been partnering with a couple of food pantries in the Worcester area. Um, and I would hope that uh, going forward, we'd be able to do a lot of that with bushels of apples. Um, so harvesting apples um, from uh, the collection and then giving that material, giving those apples away uh, to some of these food pantries that we've partnered with. Um, so not a huge plan. Um, you know, I, I think I need to uh, wrap my head around exactly what we might do with all this, all this fruit, but, um, but I think there are a couple different options that we could explore. Awesome. This is a two part question. The first part is, um, you know, if we, if there's any plan that we would need to do any treatment on our, on our trees to maybe protect them from future diseases or diseases we've been cautious about in the past. And then uh, somebody did ask, you know, for those who have obtained a tree, um, you know, if they should be thinking about anything that they might need to do from a treatment standpoint to protect it from anything. Yep. Um, so because our apple orchard is so big, uh, we actually contract out with a local um, tree company uh, to do uh, our uh, spray program. Um, we definitely adhere to an organic spray program at Tower Hill for the apples. Um, that would include things like copper applications. Uh, copper is really great as a fungicide. It's also good at, uh, at preventing fire blight. Um, so we, we will definitely do uh, a, a spray program like that. There are certain um, uh, uh, pests and diseases that we have to protect our trees from. Um, and uh, what I'd really recommend to someone who has bought a tree um, and is interested in learning more about what they should be doing to protect their tree um, is look to uh, first Fedco trees. They have a, a lot of really good information about, um, uh, about uh, how to um, successfully prevent uh, pest and disease issues on your apples. Um, and then also there's a gentleman named Michael Phillips um, who's, uh, who's a really uh, renowned expert um, in uh, apple growing, uh, in particular uh, organic uh, apple production. Um, so he's got a couple of great books. He's got a good website. Um, he's definitely someone that I would recommend you look, you look to for, for advice and for um, uh, really specific guidance about how to protect your tree or trees. Sounds like we might need to get Mark on a webinar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he'd be a great, he'd definitely be great. Uh, I think those are the big questions that people have asked. I think I would ask um, one more last question to end, and that's probably, uh, you know, what we might see from the orchard for the rest of the year or uh, what your, uh, the Hort team's plan is for uh, caring for the, the trees this year. Yeah, so um, we have a we have a little bit more work to do once all the trees are in the ground. Um, we've got we've got some uh, pretty big divots in the area that we have to fill with some loam. Um, we've got uh, because of the work that we did, we have a, a lot of ground that's been kind of really torn up. Um, so we'll we'll go over it with our York rake, try to smooth out a little bit, make it a little bit easier to walk um, in the area. And then um, we're planning to seed it uh, with a uh, just kind of a meadow mix. Um, so we are going to seed uh, the area with um, uh, uh, a mix of grasses and forbs. Um, and then my hopes, long-term hopes, I would really love to plant the understory of the apples uh, with some early spring flowering bulbs. Um, if you visited Tower Hill this season, you've seen a lot of uh, what we consider minor bulbs, things like Scylla. Um, Siberian Squill and Glory of the Snow. Uh, I would very much uh, love to see the orchard actually planted with an understory of uh, very early season bulbs like those. Um, be a nice complement uh, to the daffodil field uh, just on the other side of the property um, and also a great way to greet uh, visitors early in the spring. So that's my long-term hope is that we'll be able to actually plant the under understory of the, of the orchard with um, uh, with kind of a carpet of color 
uh, with some early spring bulbs. So uh, look for that in the, in the upcoming years. That's that's definitely something that's on my on my short list of things to do to finish off this project. Um, and then we've got to finish up the irrigation. So that's uh, that's something we had hoped to do more uh, with this winter, but unfortunately the timing of the snow and our frozen soils was such that we had to wait uh, quite a bit longer than I would have liked um, to get started. Um, so we're finishing off that irrigation actually uh, right now. Each tree will have its own um, uh, emitter so that we can keep them watered very well uh, this season, but also in future seasons. Um, and uh, I think that's about it. 